I kind of want to just continue the conversation <laughs> Tim started, but uh, maybe we can do that later. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something else. So um, thanks so much to Lev and Guy for um, inviting me to come here. So I'm just starting to think about locality in Everett. And so this is kind of a new work in progress. So I'm looking forward. I'm going to try to leave time for questions. Is this OK? I'm not feeding back or anything. No, OK. All right, good. So all right, so the way um, I want to start is just by noting like this is in the context of like a larger discussion of how we should be solving the measurement problem, uh, what kind of quantum theory we should have. And it seems like at least two points speak in favor of Everetti and quantum mechanics over other realist solutions to the measurement problem. So one is like this point about simplicity. Um, Everetti and quantum mechanics seem simpler, both in terms of fundamental ontology and ideology. It solves a measurement problem without having to postulate collapse of the wave function, so more ideology. It doesn't have to postulate hidden variables. So we've got nice, simple ontology, just have the quantum state. Uh, but another point in favor of it seems to be that it's local. So um, in the sense of not, of I don't mean in the sense of separable, I mean in the sense of local causality. So there's no action at a distance if we are Everettians. But some have questioned too. And so um, I'm going to be talking about or engaging with these papers written by Lev uh, and also Calvin McQueen, who is not here, and Kai Wagel, who is here. Um, they're not questioning whether you get local causality on an Everettian picture. But they're questioning whether it's like completely straightforward, however you understand many worlds, or however you understand ever writing quantum mechanics, whether you get it. And so uh, this is what I want to talk about today. I'm, I'm interested in like thinking through this. I think they raise a kind of interesting challenge to some other way, some the way that some other people have understood uh, ever writing quantum mechanics. Uh, but I haven't been completely convinced of these arguments that um, you don't have locality and these other ways of understanding the theory. Uh, but I do agree with them that like the way to, that we should be thinking about this and the way to think about this is by thinking about the metaphysics of, of how we're interpreting this, this theory of variety in quantum mechanics. And so that's what I'm going to explore today. All right, so the way I thought just to get us into this is I thought we would just start with a kind of very naive picture about why Everett and quantum mechanics seems local, whereas other uh, approaches to the measurement problem don't get you locality. So I'm just going to be contrasting locality with like what you would see in a, a, a theory with a collapse of the wave function like GRW. Uh, of course, we could also compare it to Bohm theory or hidden variable series. I'm just not going to do that because I'm just going to work with quantum states, and then so it'll just be simpler. But I mean, we could have, I could have compared this with Everett too. So um, let's just start with this kind of situation where you might think in other uh, theories you get non locality. So some particles are prepared in the singled state, and then the particles are sent to Alice and Bob, and they're separate labs, and Bob and Alice are going to measure their particles, or they're ready to measure their particles. Um, just like alighting here, the states of their uh, measurement apparatuses and the state of the environment, just to keep these slides simpler. But you know, here is supposed to be the quantum state. Everybody's ready to do their measurements, and then you, we've got the states of their particles. And now, suppose that Alice measures a Z spin of her particle. Bob doesn't do a measurement. The interaction with the entangled system is going to cause Alice to branch, if we're Everettians. And so we can you know, write this opposed uh, Alice quantum state according to Everettian, the Everettian. And it looks like straightforward that nothing happens to Bob and nothing happens to Bob's particle when Alice does her measurement. So it looks like Alice does her measurement over here. Bob stays the same. Bob's particle stays the same. So there's no action at a distance. But that's unlike what would happen if we had some kind of collapse interpretation like GRW. That would imply that after Alice does her measurement, the system evolves into, well, it doesn't imply, but it's very likely that the system will evolve into one of these states. Um, either way, although Bob doesn't change, his particle does, right? So we can look at that. The um, 
you know, the, the probabilities that are associated with Bob's particles, things are different um, after Alice does her measurement where that isn't the case for Everettian quantum mechanics. So it looks like GRW does involve non-local action, Everettian quantum mechanics does not. Okay. So I'm taking that to be like just a kind of standard argument that look, uh, you don't have uh, any kind of non-locality if you're an Everettian, and that's, you know, because of the way, you know, we have this, this branching that nothing is going to change with respect to Bob or Bob's particle after Alice does her measurement. So in these papers, I, I should note, like, this paper of Kelvin and Lev's from 2018 that I'm engaging with, I thought was a really, really interesting paper. Um, it's, not primarily, it's not primarily about locality. Kai and Kelvin's paper is primarily about locality and how we can have a truly local uh, quantum theory, particularly. They talk about uh, many worlds. Lev and, and Kelvin's paper is more about um, probability and probability in Everett, and they're, this part that I'm talking about is coming in where they're kind of arguing with uh, Chip uh, Sebens and um, and Sean Carroll, and when they develop their self-locating uncertainty kind of model of the probability in Everett, and so. Kelvin and Lev are kind of saying what Chip and the way Chip and Sean think about branching is no good, and and here's because they get non they have non locality, so so that's a kind of broader context, um, but what I'm interested is in in these papers by Kai and Lev and Kelvin they're saying that story I just told is not really that simple, so according to them you it can be the case that you can be an Everettian and you can have local uh, a local metaphysics, but we have to be careful about the story I just told. So in particular, when we think about this transition from Alice and Bob getting ready to do their measurement to the situation after Alice has done her measurement, but Bob hasn't, in order to preserve locality, we have to interpret that state as one in which Alice's measurement does not cause Bob to branch, right? So yes, in a sense, we can see Bob, we can multiply through, we have Bob on in both of these branches, the Alice branch where she measures spin up and the Alice branch where she measures spin down. Um, but we shouldn't understand things that, in that naive way that, there, it, that it turns out Bob branches and so now there are two Bobs. Um, if Alice's measurement causes Bob to branch and it looks like there's non-local action in Everettian quantum mechanics. Okay. So what do they propose instead? So what, what Calvin and Lev propose in, their, in this 2018 paper is we should say that branching occurs locally. And so in the case where Alice measures her particle but Bob does not, there remains only one Bob. There are two worlds. The one where Alice measures, right, the z-spin of particle one is, comes out as uh, up and the one where it comes out is down. So there are these two worlds, but there's one Bob and Bob is located in both the worlds. Okay, so with my analytic metaphysics hat on, I think I can understand the difference between the two interpretations of Everett and quantum mechanics are contra they're contrasting. So the one is Alice does her measurement, Bob branches, so now there are two Bobs. I'll just call them Bob, Bob plus two and Bob minus two. Bob in the world where his particle, if you were to measure it, would be spin up. Bob, the other Bob, which lives in the world where if you were to measure his particle, you would get spin down. Um, and then, so that's the one option, that's the one they don't like, because Alice's measurement over here causes Bob over here to branch. Um, and then the other option, the one they do like, is one where we say Bob doesn't branch, and so after Alice does her measurement, there's still just one Bob, but this Bob is bilocated in the two Alice worlds. Okay. So this is a very subtle, I think it's a very subtle difference. Um, and so when I read this, I was like, whoa, that's like a very, subtle thing that I see a metaphysician could understand the difference, but it's going to have these significant consequences. That's interesting. So I want to look at this proposal more closely. All right. So, um, so here's how I'm th it's helpful for me to draw these diagrams because now I can think through this more clearly. All right. So, so here's the like global branching picture. So it was Chip and Sean like kind of made these distinctions between what they want to call global branching. So this is like what Chip and Sean prefer, this global branching picture, and then what they call local branching. Um, Lev and Kelvin kind of call it, they have, talk about semi-local branching. Uh, 
I'm not going to use that language, but I think it's intuitive, like this kind of picture, uh, the Chip and Sean picture that we can think of as a global branching, because what happens is Alice does, when Alice does her measurement, everything branches, okay? So the whole world branches. And so where we started with just one Alice, one Bob, we can imagine we've got this particle, these particles in an entangled state. Then Alice does her measurement, and that splits the world. And so now we have two Alice, one I'll call Alice plus one, one I call Alice minus one, two Bobs, and four particles. And so what they, what they propose is, you know, they say, no, that's not okay, because now look, Alice did her measurement over here, now we have two Bobs, so Alice did something here, Bob changed over here, this is non-locality. So what we have to say is Bob did not branch, and so we, I, we still have these two worlds, but there's just one Bob. Um, we can ask about, I'll come back to Bob's particle later, but they're just talking about Bob, so let's just think about Bob for now, but I think it's, there's a question about what's going on with Bob's particle too, but I'm just, I think the way they want to think about this, I've just like written down like, well, we could think the reduced density matrix associated with Bob's particle hasn't changed either. So there's just still one Bob's particle, and it, it hasn't changed as a result of Alice's measurement either. All right, now, now that I like kind of can look at this, I'm thinking, all right, uh, Lev and Kelvin, you want to say this is better because now Alice, ha or Bob, Alice hasn't caused Bob to branch at a distance, but it still seems to me like something has happened to Bob because, I mean, if we're going to go here and be like thinking about these really abstract different metaphysical possibilities, Bob is now bilocated, right? Before the measurement, he wasn't bilocated, now he is. So he branches, he becomes bilocated. Either way, something's happened to Bob. If you really want like a full local picture, I think what you want is what I would call here local branching, where nothing happens to Bob. Nothing happens to Bob's particle. He doesn't become, he doesn't branch, he doesn't become bilocated, nothing's happened to him. Um, now that's really, now I'm really sure nothing's happened to Bob. But it seems to me, if you want to say nothing happens, you know, but they say what we need is this other kind of intermediate model. So why don't they have the full local branching model? Um, I think the reason we don't, they don't want to have local branching um, is that they're thinking due to the decoherence process when Alice does her measurement, um, you're going to have the branching kind of ripple out to Bob even you know, in this situation we're, think, we're imagining the whole time that Alice doesn't communicate the re result of her experiment. So I think that this is right. Um, now, as David Wallace points out in his book, the branching will ripple out. It's not going to be instantaneous. So it's not going to be instantaneous. So this is what uh, David says in his book when he's talking about this kind of, is, is there non-locality because of this branching process? Um, he's saying, no, straightforwardly, there's no non-locality, there's nothing, this isn't happening at like faster than the speed of light. Um, so he says, when microscopic superposition is magnified up to macroscopic scales by quantum measurement or other natural processes, it leads to a branching event which propagates outward at the speed of whatever dynamical interactions causing decoherence. In practice, it propagates out at the speed of light. Um, but it will propagate, it will propagate outward. And so I think... Um, if we want to have this kind of standard picture of ever of Everettian quantum mechanics with due coherence, then we're stuck immediately after Alice's measurement. Whether Alice communicates her result to Bob or not, we're going to be stuck with one of these models. Okay, so it might take take some a little bit of time, but pretty much, you know, even before Alice communicates a result to Bob, we're going to have one of these other options. Uh, global branching, or what I'm calling here McQueen vitamin branching, uh, where we won't have that kind of local branching picture anymore, where Bob doesn't, you know, Bob only exists in one world. All right, so let's come back to these options. All right, so the objection, what I was concerned with here, or so far my concern was the motivation for not having that kind of global branching picture 
that um, that Chip and Sean had, which I think I I think is is a kind of more standard way to understand branching. Um, was if you do that, then you're going to say that uh, Alice's measurement over here causes Bob to branch even when she doesn't communicate her result to Bob. And that seems wrong. Um, so we need to have this picture where Bob doesn't branch. But then I said, but something's still happening to Bob there because now Bob's becoming bilocated. So what's, what's the difference? So I think what Kelvin and Lev could say in response is, well, yes, okay, that's fine. You can say, okay, something happened to Bob. He became bilocated. <laughs> He's in two worlds now. But um, it's not really a significant change because it's ju that's just an unobservable metaphysical change in Bob. Uh, whereas if you have the global branching picture, it isn't just that there's this like metaphysical change that now there are two Bobs. It's, there's a significant empirical change because in the global branching model, there are two Bobs, and that means that these Bobs have different dispositional features and relations. So Bob plus two in the global branching picture, lives in a world where his particles Z spin up. And he, so he has a 100% chance of finding his particle to be Z spin up. And then the other, Bob minus two, lives in his world, in a world where his particles Z spin down. And so he has a 0% chance of finding his particle Z spin up. So that's a, that's a significant difference. It's not a, just a mere metaphysical difference that he branched. And then they can continue that you, so you should prefer their style of branching because for them, now there's only a single Bob after Alice does her measurement and this new Bob doesn't have the, any new extrinsic or disposi dis dispositional features he didn't have before Alice's measurement. Ooh. So, you know, they're going to say just like before Alice did her measurement, it was indeterminate what Bob would get if he were to measure his particle. Still, after Alice does her measurement on the McQueen of vitamin branching, it's indeterminate, right? Because there's just this one Bob, and it's indeterminate whether, what he's going to get as a result of a measurement. So that's what I imagine the response is. And I, I, get, I, I, I get that. But it seems like if, if you were going to defend global branching, you would say, I think the right thing to say here is, OK, that is true about these Bobs that they, there are different things they would, or different results they would get if they were to measure the z-spin of their particles, but those are purely extrinsic changes to Bob. It isn't the case, or to the Bobs, it isn't the case that there's any intrinsic change to Bob that was caused by Alice's measurement. So to motivate this, so there's no non-local action on the global branching picture. And so to motivate this, I just want to give like the standard metaphysicians, the standard philosophers um, example that's used to show why things like this are not, don't involve any non-locality. So the standard kind of example that we like to talk about is what happens when Socrates drinks the hemlock and dies. You could say, well, when Socrates drinks the hemlock and dies, the amphibi not in the prison with Socrates, somewhere else, maybe not even in Athens, instantly becomes a widow. Okay, so she changed. Socrates over here drinks a hemlock, Xanthippe over there becomes a widow. Um, is that non-locality? Is that non-local action? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> and the reason is because this isn't a real change to Xanthippe. It's not in, it, there's no change here in her intrinsically. So Peter Geach, the metaphysician Peter Geach, introduces disti distinction between real intrinsic change to objects and mere Cambridge changes. Um, and so this is like a classic example of this. The change to Xanthippe is a Cam it's a mere Cambridge change. It's extrinsic. Yeah, she now has this property that she didn't have earlier. Before she wasn't a widow, now she is a widow. But that doesn't involve any non-local action because being a widow is not an intrinsic property of her. It's a relational property. So I want to say the same thing in this case. It is the case that now, you know, this Bob lives in a world with a spin-up particle, okay? But that's not an intrinsic change to him. That is an extrinsic, it's a new extrinsic property that the Bob has. 
All right, so, so that's the response, and that's why I, I say, you know, you don't need to go, you, we can just understand things that the way Chip and Sean did in their paper and say that there's global branching, and so yes, now there are two bobs. I mean, really, I'll, I'll come to this in a second, there are always two bobs, but, but there are two bobs, and um, that's, not, that's not a problem here. It doesn't mean there's non-local action. Um, now here, I think there is something, if I was, if I were Lev and, or Kelvin <laughs> and Kai, I would come back and say, um, but what about the branching? Okay, so you're saying the fact that Bob now lives in a world where his particles spin up, or, you know, to say a similar thing, Bob is such that, it wasn't the case earlier, but now is the case that if Bob were to measure the spin of his particle, he would with certainty get spin up. You're saying that's a mere extrinsic change to Bob. Fine, yes, that's about his relation to other things. But what about the branching itself? Before there was just one me, one Bob. Now there are two. Isn't that itself an intrinsic change, right? So how could that be also just a mere Cambridge change to Bob? I think that's like also straightforwardly a mere Cambridge change. That's what I want to say here. So, so the question is, isn't branching an intrinsic change? The short answer is no. So, I mean, you can see this just by thinking about if it's obvious that becoming a widow is a mere Cambridge change, becoming a twin or not stopping being a twin, that is also an intrinsic or extrinsic a property, right? Whether or not you have a twin is an extrinsic feature. It depends on whether there's this other person. Um, it's, it's not just a fact about you. That's, that's a short answer, but to be more careful, I just want to kind of, this is like my last, I don't know how long I have now, but um, I think I'm okay. I'm just going to assume I'm okay, but you, you can stop me if I'm not. Uh, to be more careful, I think we've just got to, again, I want to have a diagram and kind of think through this more carefully to explain like why it is the case that um, even if Alice's measurement causes Bob to branch, that's not an, um, it's not an intrinsic change to Bob. So to do that, I think we just have to think more carefully about persistence. So just start by recognizing that like the right way to think about persistence or the, like the very standard way in metaphysics to think about persistence is to think about persistence as perdurance. So what that means is, well, according to the perdurantist, the person who has a perdurance theory of persistence, persisting objects like human observers, like Bob, are space-time worms. Okay, so that, that means that there are entities that don't just have three-dimensional boundaries, they have four-dimensional boundaries, and so they also have temporal parts, just like they have spatial parts. So just like I have a left hand and a right hand, so I have these two spatial parts. I also have temporal parts, so I have like a 10-year-old temporal part, I have a 45-year-old temporal part, and so on. Um, so objects are, are spread out over uh, space-time, not just over space, and then the perdurantist is gonna, I mean, this is an important question for us, what's intrinsic change? Intrinsic change to an object is just one of these temporal parts having an intrinsic feature that another temporal parts uh, another temporal part lacks. Okay, so arguably, so this is a way like David Lewis argued for this theory of perdurance in his book on the plural, plural, plurality of worlds. Um, for Lewis, it's like you can't even understand intrinsic change if you're not a perdurantist. Um, so that's the, I mean, that's one of the arguments for the view. So the picture here is just like, how could there be an intrinsic change to Bob? Well, there's an intrinsic change to Bob if he has a temporal part that has an intrinsic property, and another one of his temporal parts lacks that intrinsic property. Okay, so this one temporal part is yellow, this other one isn't. Uh, that's what it would be to have an extrinsic change. And I have these like, non-identity signs here that just to illustrate that, you know, the, the view is you've got Bob is the whole worm, and then there are these parts, and the parts themselves are not identical. So like the earlier part is not identical to the later part, just like my left hand is not identical to my right hand. These are distinct objects. My, my spatial parts are distinct, my temporal parts are also distinct. Okay, but the whole thing is, is me, and I'm self-identical. Okay. 
So now we've got this branching situation. This is going to be you know, more complicated. It, here, how do we think about the branching situation? Well, the natural thing to think is you've got two worms. So I've drawn these as non-spatially overlapping, but I mean, arguably, just because Alice does her measurement, that doesn't mean that the bobs are going to start doing different things. Uh, I mean, maybe if they have libertarian free will, they start doing different things. But we don't have to worry about that. Let's just, you know, I'm just drawing them as spread out because, for, well, for obvious reasons. So you can see there are two ones here. Bob minus two and Bob plus two. They overlap before Alice does her measurement. At that time, they just they share a temporal part. That doesn't mean there's only one Bob at that time. There's still two Bobs there. Bob minus two and Bob plus two, it's just they share a temporal part. But that's not really puzzling or interesting. It's just like, you know, we're used to things spatially, different things spatially overlapping. Like when you're driving on the Interstate 90 and you get into Massachusetts, then you're on the Mass Pike and you're also on Interstate 90. You're on, there are two roads there. They're spatially overlapping. That's what's going on here at the earlier time before Alice does her measurement. There are two Bobs. OK, so the point here, what we want to get to is there's no reason to think, because Alice does her measurement, that there's any intrinsic change. Okay. The first Bob, Bob minus two, doesn't have an intrinsic change because he doesn't, there's no reason to think, because Alice did her measurement, that he's got different intrinsic properties from the time that he, after he branched to the time before the branching event. Um, and same thing for Bob plus two. Okay, so since there's no different, neither of these worms, there's any reason to think, has a different intrinsic property than it had earlier because of the measurement, there is no intrinsic change. Okay, so the branching is just a Cambridge change. All right, so the conclusion here is I don't think that McQueen and vitamin branching provides a superior metaphysical model to the global branching picture. Um, that said, I do feel the pull of their concern because there seems to be a change in Bob brought about due to Alice's measurement and that he branches. But that change is just a mere Cambridge change. And so we can continue to state the naive explanation of why Everetti and quantum mechanics is local but GRW is not and allow that Bob also branches. So this is just the kind of story, the naive story I told at the beginning. Um, right, so Bob's particle, right, if we're Everettians, does get, or sorry, if, if we have the GRW theory, it is the case that Bob's particle is intrinsically affected at a distance by Alice's measurement. But that's not the case in Everettian quantum mechanics. Even if Bob branches, even if the particle branches... Oh, well, okay, let's talk about the particle. Sorry, there's just this is a postscript. So you could worry something's going on with Bob's particle, like... If you look at the model, um, or these diagrams I had here, for McQueen vitamin branching, it looks like nothing's really happened to Bob's particle. You still just have the one particle, and then, because I had to separate it from Alice's particle, which it looks like Alice's particle did branch. Is that the right? Yeah, OK. There are two Alice particles now. Um, then. It, it, it seems like on their model, nothing happened to Bob's particle either, but you could worry, oh, but it looks like on global branching, even though you, you want to say it's just a Cambridge change to Bob, you might worry it's not a mere Cambridge change to Bob's particle here. Um, but I think we have to insist on the same about both. So whatever we want to say about Bob's particle, the global branching person should say the same thing about Bob's particle also, that Bob's particle only changes extrinsically. So it is a case if somebody were to, if Bob were to send his particle through the stern girl like device and, you know, we know what would happen to it. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is, I have one more sentence, thank you. Um, but that's only an extrinsic change. And so then, you know, as far as intrinsic properties go, this is the last, I just want to say this last thing, you could ask, but, but, well, but something intrinsic is maintained from earlier, before Alice's measurement to after? I think yes. But if we want to start thinking about intrinsic properties, so this is a kind of like background, the way I'm thinking about things. Maybe this is obvious. That I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about things the way like David Wallace and Chris Timpson do, the metaphysics here is like a space-time state realism. And so when we're talking about intrinsic properties, we're thinking about these reduced density matrices associated with space-time points. 
there, if you're thinking about that, they're, again, they're associated to space-time regions. They're not associated with particles. And so the reduced sensing matrix associated with that region where Bob's particle is, is the same before and after Alice's measurement. Um, so yeah, there's no change to intrinsic pro properties. Um, OK, but this is hard to think through. And I, I want to thank Lev and, and Kai and Calvin for writing the paper, because I think this is like a really, for me, it's a very interesting discussion. So that's it. Um, I had a postscript on wave function realism, which I didn't talk about. But that's all. Thank you. Oh, good. OK. Um, I am a pattern. Um, You're a particle? A pattern. OK. In the beginning of the conference, you haven't been here, I, made an, I started this experiment. I split the word. I used my word splitter, and then um, I asked computer to make left and right. It was some experiment, far away, like your experiment with Alice. And it's, uh, the information came from me. And when I see left, I moved left, like up. And uh, when I, uh, so if in parallel world, I, I, in, in fact, in parallel world, it was left. In this world, I saw right. So of course, the left person will move left, and the right person will move right. It's a different pattern. So clearly different left. I also consider different lefts if, an, if an, I'm log, if it's the same Local pattern, but a different in space. If somebody will move me, what I said, another experiment, I'm sleeping, somebody perform experiment, and if it's up, somebody move me as a whole to the left or to the right, even my uh, relative state is exactly the same, but since it's in different position in three dimensions, which are very important, then it's two different lefts. If I would make my experiment, I will push the button, but then sometimes I do this, but I make my screen in such a way that no message come to me. So <coughs> the experiment split the world. So some experiment that is up and down. But it doesn't change my wave function, not in space and not in any form. <coughs> so nothing changed to me. I cannot say that nothing changed because there is, there is one pattern, one pattern, one left, one pattern, one bow. And it's not the situation about um, the particle. In, also, in my view, the splitting is local. In the moment, again, in this particular case, the bulk space changed because there was entangled particle. The, the bulk, uh, on a level, on all words together, nothing happened with bulk particle. <laughs> it's still in a, unpolarized. But in every word, it is polarized. In one, it's up, in another, it's down. So the splitting for particle is global. So the word was split. But there is only one left, and it belongs to two words. And you cannot ask in which word he lives, because there is no any physical, any other meaning. There is Alice's measurement makes two words, doesn't make two bobs. There is one bob who lives in both, but both words, and you cannot ask in which word he is. OK. I mean, I don't really know what to say. I, I, OK, so that means I accurately presented your view. I, I think at the end you said that it should be the same for particle and for both. No. Oh, 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 oh OK. I didn't get that. OK. In, in so, so world, sorry. The particle what? is different. The splitting is global. So uh, again, if there is nothing okay. entangled, then so, nothing will change far away. But wait, if wait. there are entangled particles like here, Alice's measurements change the space of both, from uh, he changes the both. Oh, well, okay. So your okay. Part, so your view. Okay, okay. Thanks. So so you're saying that the the picture I have here is accurate. Your view with Bob, because there's only one Bob, but not accurate with respect to the particle. So for you, see, this is what I had originally in my like. I gave this paper at Chapman a month ago, and I, I had that. And I changed it, because I was like, no, surely, um, surely you're not going to say that Bob's particle splits. Um, oh, you do? 
Okay, no, not of course, because if you say if you say that, then why can't you say the same for Bob? That Bob because, branches because Bob, Bob's particle is over here, and Alice is over here. So now Alice did something, and she affected Bob's particle. So by your own lights, you should say that's non-locality. Both uh, there are two words after Alice's triplet. Yes. Okay. In, yes. In this word, still we can ask, what are what are the other objects? There are some Andromeda remains the same. In both in Alice's it's performed measurement. If there's no entanglement, there's Andromeda, there is the same Andromeda. There is one Andromeda in the same in both worlds. Bob also didn't change its quantum state because it, he didn't look on his particle. Okay. So the Bob also remains the same. But the particle, the Bob's particle in the world uh, up, yeah. Alice. It's different than the Bob's particle in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the second particle. Okay, so I, n now I see, I, I see that. I, I see why you want to say that, and, and, but, but then why isn't that a problem? Because you say that if you, you, comp you say that Chip and Sean are wrong in their picture because Chip and Sean say that after Alice's measurement, there are two Bobs. Yeah. And that's action at a distance. So why isn't this action at a distance that now there are two Bob particles? In the world, there is action at a distance. No problem. Yes, but of course, you, when you're within the world, you have bell inequalities, you have randomness, you have all kinds of things. Within the world, there is action at a distance. There is no action at a distance, only on a level of the whole world together. So when we talk about uh, action at a distance and many words we, we did it brilliantly in the beginning we showed that you look your quantum state and nothing happened um, and uh, when Alice is performed me measurement if you look on two words together uh -huh. nothing changed on both sides on two words together but now we can ask what's happened in every word and they made some proof of born rule trying to say that you can ask a question in which word Bob is and this question is illegitimate. So the proof is not a proof. They don't have a born proof, although they started with the same self-location uncertainty, which I suggested before, but they use it in a way. If you need to move me to one place to another, then there are two words for Bob. You can ask which Bob, which Bob he is. But if Bob was not moved, there is only one Bob. You cannot ask who, who he in which who he is. There is only one story. You cannot ask. The, there are two, of, two parts. For probability, you need a matter of fact. And there is no matter of fact A or matter of fact B. There is only one Bob. You cannot ask in which word he is. You can ask about the particle. This is a different story. OK, I'm not, I'm not seeing that you don't have the same problem. I feel like what you're saying about Bob's particle is undermining your argument against Chip and Sean, but but um, but we yeah. I, I, but I get. I think we've reached a stalemate for now, at least. Thank you, Elisa. It was a very clear exposition. I think. Um, I just want to mention maybe like a lot of it's messy conundrum to make sense of what happens to Bob and and all this splitting and so well done on your, on your exposition. But I think all of these problems really hinge on the fact that the wave function is not a separable object. And so it's quite messy to think of, okay, what happens to Bob if it's Alice split and so on. So we have a separable <laughs> description of in the Heisenberg picture. So maybe just as a short advertisement, stay tuned for Samuel Kuiper's talk in the Heisenberg picture. We okay. see how the splitting occurs completely locally in bubbles. Okay, so. thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, that lo lovely talk. I, uh, I don't know if the microphone's on. Hello. Oh, there you go. Okay, I've got yeah. to be. Yeah. yeah. So lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I, I your re the interchange with Lev is perhaps related to my question in that you go to the um, analysis to account for the particle. Um, uh, this is Chris oh, you mean, yes, yeah, space-time state realism. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I, I should have said that earlier in the paper. I'm just thinking in that, yeah. those terms. I'm just, that's what I want to think, yeah, but, about the metaphysics, yeah. Then I'm not clear, why, why don't you do the same when you're talking about Bob? 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, then you come back to Bob, and, and that's another way to say there's no non-local, right? right. Or, or it's, it's almost like worrying about Bob is, it's clear that the intrinsic, the intrinsic state associated with Bob's space-time region hasn't changed, so yeah. Um, yeah, I think I could have said that earlier. I think it was like, by the time I got to the Bob, But I still think we can ask questions about Bob and his particle. And so I think what I said, I'm very satisfied with what I said about Bob. And I'm less satisfied. So I didn't need that crutch, <laughs> I guess, there. When I got to Bob's particle, then I felt like I needed a crutch. So I went there. So, but I want to come back and think, like, this is kind of, this is new. So I'm, I want to come back and think about that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Both? Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Really wonderful talk. Um, I'm just a little bit confused um, about how is it possible that there is no intrinsic change in Bob's particle in the global branching model? Because, like, let's consider measurement on, su suppose Alice does not measure, right? Then once you measure, measure um, Bob's particle, the intrinsic state of Bob, determines that there's a 50-50 chance up or down and branches. Cool. Then suppose Alice measures instead and consider some, you know, suppose Alice measures and then Bob's also branched, right? Okay, and, so and Bob measured and now Alice measures. Sorry, sorry. A new case. Okay. <laughs> Alice measure okay. now. Yeah. Alice is branched, wow. in a global branching, Bob is also branched, and Bob's particle is also branched. Uh -huh. In this case, we've got two particles, and each particle has a 100% chance of getting up, or 100% chance of getting down. But such chance is intrinsically determined, right? So, uh, that's what I'm denying at the end, that's, yeah. Or intrinsically determined, um, I, I mean, no. Yeah, I'm saying no. Uh, so if I, I mean it depends what you, you had so are we imagining what it, what is the case but, I mean I, at the end it was just the case I was talking about right Alice does her measurement Bob doesn't and you're asking does Bob's particle the fact that Bob's part that's the case right it's just Alice did her measurement okay and so now the fact is though if we talk about this guy, this particle I'm calling two down, that has a 100% chance of being deflected down, right, coming out, spin down. And you're asking, is that intrinsically determined by the particle? That's why I'm saying no. But if it, the, my question, the, the particle going down and the part, or the particle going up uh -huh. is a sort of intrinsic change to the region, let's say. So if it isn't intrinsic, well, we can, yeah, we can keep talking. Thank you.